So uh, my plan uh, for this lecture is to, to talk about the very last thing in chapter seven, which is um, orbital motion. Um, there's also gravitational potential energy, but um, I'm thinking just to skip that. Um, if there are problems about that on the homework, I'll go back and make those extra credit because um, I'm not going to, to talk about it. It is in the handout, but um, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and then um, talk about the very uh, first few ideas in uh, chapter eight. So before I launch into all of that, um, do you guys have any questions? Um, I have a question about chapter eight. Um, in one of your videos, you were um, saying that the center of mass and the center of gravity are equal um, when at the surface surface of the earth, but they're not equal with large distances. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you kind of explain that? Yeah, um, so I derived center of um, mass using the definition of weight that is mg, right? So um, and I'll talk about um, center of center of mass um, later in this lecture, but let me share my screen so I can draw something. There. So, one of these scratch papers out, pages ought to be. Yeah. Here. So this is the very end of, of that. So I had suggested that. Um, this doesn't make sense without me having built it in real time. So if I just have two masses that are some distance from like a point. There's my point. Come on. There. Right. Any point, which isn't some reference point. So I've got R1 and R2 here. Um, and the weight, if the weight equals mg, right, m1g and m2g, that doesn't add any um, distance terms to this, to this line, right? And I use this to derive this equation. Um, but if the weight depends on your distance from that um, from that point, um, which it does when we're talking about like um, celestial scale objects, right? So the the force that the moon feels due to the Earth is not mg because um, the acceleration due to the gravity of the Earth at the elevation of the moon is not 9.8 meters per second squared. I think it's um, Oh, I can't remember the order of magnitude. I remember the numbers, but not the order. It's much, much smaller. Um, so to find the force of gravity on the moon um, due to the Earth, you have to use um, the G M M over R squared. But that R adds another um, R to this expression. And so you wouldn't get this for celestial bodies. But we're not going to talk about the center of mass for um, systems in, in space anyway. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. You bet. Um, yeah, suffice it to say for us, um, center of mass and center of gravity are technically different things, but when you can treat weight like mg, they're the same. Um, okay, cool. So let's um, let's talk then. Actually, the thing I want to talk about is orbital motion. So uh, here's the, the scratch uh, paper that I built for, for orbital motion. Um, let me pause. Uh, Megan asked a question, that's great. Does anyone else have questions? I should have asked. Okay. Okay. Um, so orbital motion. Um, orbital motion is, is just circular motion caused by um, gravity, right? So that basically takes the two ideas we've talked about so far in this chapter and puts them together, right? Which is awesome. Um, uh, so that's that's what this picture is, right? We've got um, the moon orbiting Earth with some velocity. It's V um, O, like lowercase o for orbital velocity and R O for um, um, orbital radius for that. So um, the radius of the of the moon's orbit, which is distinct from the radius of the moon, right? 
um, for notation's sake, I try to use lowercase r for orbital distances and capital R for um, planet um, radii, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so I filled in Newton's second law here, the sum of the forces in the radial direction equals mass times the radial acceleration. Um, but that's just, um, again, gravity is causing the, um, the, the acceleration. So gravity is the force, centripetal acceleration on the right. And you can use that to relate um, the orbital velocity to the mass of the Earth and the orbital velocity, or sorry, the orbital radius of the of the moon. So I want to make this this point. This mass here, if you're just looking through the equation sheet, like, okay, what do I plug in? Um, the mass is generally the mass of the thing being orbited, not the mass of the orbiting thing. Does that make sense? So this mass, in this example, this is the mass of the Earth, not the mass of the moon. Right now, if we were talking about the Earth orbiting around the Sun, this would be the mass of the Sun, not the mass of the Earth. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. So there's an equation. Um, I related orbital velocity to orbital radius just by saying um, the velocity should be some distance over some time. Circumference divided by period is a specific distance divided by the time it takes to go that distance, right? So that's a, an equation that's useful. And you can put those together and get Kepler's third law. Again, I talked about all this in the video, so I'm, I'm not going to um, describe it much more right now. I just want to work a couple examples. I need to find um, the document that reminds me which examples I was going to work. Not that one. Oh yeah, I'd like to work example number nine. So let's. So this is chapter seven, example nine, just toward the end. That's 15, Jewish. Um, yeah, okay. So example nine here says um, Phobos, which is a moon of Mars, has an acceleration due to gravity of six millimeters per second squared and a radius of 11 kilometers. Um, what is the orbital speed of a very low altitude satellite? And then what is its period? Okay, so let's draw this picture. It's um, so this is a moon of Mars. Come on. So I don't need to, to draw Mars here because I'm not talking about Phobos going around Mars. It does, but um, that's not what we're talking about here. Here we've got Phobos, sure. And some, um, some object in very low altitude orbit. So let's draw an object. Sure, and it's gonna have some orbital speed, phenot, Missed one, at least one. And some orbital radius that we could draw in there. Let's make it blue. And the question is, what is that orbital speed? Um, okay, so there's a keyword here, and I, I just told you um, little r is orbital radius and big r is radius of an object here we're going to treat them like they're the same because the the keywords here are very low altitude so we're going to treat it like the radius of the planet is the radius of that orbit does that make sense so we're saying radius of the orbit is 11 kilometers. Again, that's also the radius of the planet. Technically, RO should be, you know, bigger than the radius of the planet. But if it's not much bigger, right? Let's say it's even in like an orbit that's uh, 
you know, 500 meters above the above the planet's surface. That would only be 11.5 versus 11. So, um, so this is pretty good to get us an order of magnitude of how fast this is going. Because I'd like to know how fast does this have to orbit at this height. Um, okay, so we can write down like what are some equations that we had? Well, well we just said the orbital radius is um, is root g m over r. So capital G is just the gravitational constant, right? It's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. R here is the orbital radius, which I know. And M is the mass of Phobos. The mass of Phobos. Um, I don't know the mass of Phobos, so I can't use that equation yet. But I know something else, right? I know um, little g for Phobos is 6 millimeters per second squared. 6 millimeters per second squared. Little g on Earth is 10 meters per second squared, right? 9.8 meters per second squared. So how high could you jump on this um, moon of Mars? Um, that's a question for another time. We can answer it. We have all the tools we need to answer that question. But um, so it's a really, really small g. OK. Can I get the mass of Phobos out of that? The answer is yes. Um, this is in another, I think, another part of the video that I it may have been in um, the universal gravitation video. Um, remember that, um, yeah, if uh, F sub G also needs to equal MG, you can use this expression to calculate or to, to derive that G is G M over R squared. Do you guys remember that from the video? Seven of, seven of you that watched the video? I'm joking. I haven't looked at that to see how many people watched it. Again, you can derive that equation just by setting the gravitational force um, defined by mg uh, equal to the gravitational force defined by um, gmm over r squared. Okay, so um, so I can use that to find the mass of Phobos, right? So I could subscript these. That's g Phobos. That's mass Phobos, and this is the radius of the of Phobos. The more I say it, the weirder it sounds. Okay, so we're ready. Step one, we're going to calculate the mass of this moon. And step two, we're going to plug it into the equation for um, orbital velocity. So the next bit is a couple bits of math. Let me ask, are there questions about this like conceptually so far? Okay, so we can plug some numbers in. Um, six millimeters per second squared. I need that to be an SI unit. So the six times 10 to the minus three meters per second squared equals 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times this mass that we're looking for. Um, let's make this go away. Divided by 11 kilometers. So that's times 10 to the 3 meters squared. If you do that, you change the problem. Come on. Aha. If you do that, you get the mass as um, it's in here. Nope, I didn't do it that way on the handout. That's fine. There's another way you can do this, but I, I didn't want to do it that way here. So I'll just um, do the math in real time. So it's 6e minus 3 times 11e3 squared. Divided by g. 
what I get is one point oh eight eight times ten to the sixteen kilograms. Okay. Does that number make sense? Well, I mean, it's really, really big. <laughs> Um, it's a mass of a moon of Mars, and Mars is smaller than Earth. So it ought to be quite a bit smaller than the mass of Earth, and the mass of Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24, which is really our only um, touchstone for this, for the scale of masses. So on that scale, like, yeah, this, is, this isn't crazy, right? It's much, much bigger than the mass of a car, but it's quite a bit smaller than, that, than the mass of Earth. Um, and that's, that's good enough for now. Right. I mean, if we trust we did the math right, this is right. But it's always, it's always good to have a, a sense of, is it really right? OK, so that's an intermediate and we're going to plug that in right here. Do I have space? Yeah, a little bit. That's supposed to be the eraser. There we go. OK, so the next bit, orbital velocity is the square root of um, GM over R, I think. So that's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. The mass we just found divided by R, which is 11 kilograms, one half. If you do that math, um, Get a syntax error. I didn't put a parentheses. Yeah, I get eight point one meters per second. Okay. So you know what that means. If you're standing on the surface of Phobos, um. Be careful not to jump too hard because you might you might um, jump hard enough to escape the, the planet. But if you uh, had a baseball, you could throw it into orbit. You could throw it like sideways and, and just watch, watch out because it's coming back behind you. Does that make sense? Again, this is because um, little g, the acceleration due to gravity on Phobos is tiny, so tiny. Um, I really like the idea of being able to throw something into orbit. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to call that good for chapter seven um, and move on to chapter eight. Uh, last call on questions from chapter seven. Again, I'm skipping gravitational potential. Um, we've already talked about gravitational potential energy. It's just we defined it for the old force, um, and now we have a new force expression, um, and so we got a new expression for the gravitational potential. Um, the only thing that I'm I'm sad that we're missing out on there is escape velocity, like how how fast do you have to jump off of the surface of something to to escape it. Um, but you can check that out yourself. Uh, okay, so on to chapter eight. Um, I did post three videos for this, um, so let's crash intro those because again you've you've seen it i hope let me bring up my guide for what am i talking about um okay so we're going to talk about um more on rotation right because i've said before let me just get a new scratch scratch thing Sure, that's fine. Okay, uh, so I've talked about before everything you can do in linear motion you can do for rotation, and we've done that. We did um, kinematics, right? We wrote um, kinematic equations for for um, for theta, omega, and alpha. Remember, those are just um, the rotational um, analogs to position, velocity, and acceleration. They're just angular position, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. We did uniform motion. 
right? Um, and for uniform motion, we had a constant omega. Um, the new thing there was now we've got um, a centripetal acceleration that causes that. Um, but we haven't talked yet about dynamics. And what I mean by that is um, Newton's second law. Newton's, yep, yeah, that's not how you spell Newton. Die in here. Newton's second law. So what I'm trying to match is F equals M A. And I, I want to relate um, some kind of force to angular acceleration. All right. And it turns out when you go to rotate something, and this is what I put in the video, when you go to rotate something like this is a door from above, and this is the hinge, you can apply a force, the same force at several locations, but get different results, right? If you push a door right at the hinge, it's not going to move. If you push a door at the center, it will accelerate, but not as much as it would if you pushed um, further from the hinge, right? So we've got um, not just a force, but also um, what we're tempted to call a radius. And it kind of is, but really it's the distance between the axis of rotation and where the force is applied. Um, I'm even going to write that. Um, it's it's important to say. So let me let me write the equation for torque, and then we'll. So we capture these two things in um, this idea of torque, which is kind of like a rotational force, right? It's not exactly a force. It's um. It's it's torque, right? So tau equals r times f times sine theta. F is clearly the force. Um, r is the distance between the axis of rotation, right? In this case, it's the hinge, right? It's the thing that things are rotating around. The distance between the axis of rotation and um, where the force is applied. And I've been teaching this for years, and I cannot think of a more succinct way to say that. The distance between, really, it's the vector that connects the axis of rotation to the point of force application. Um, and then theta here is the angle between um, F and R. All right, so in um, the picture I drew right here, those are that's 90 degrees, right? And if I applied a force this way, it would be a um, zero degrees, I guess. Yeah, I would call that zero or 180. It doesn't matter because sine of zero equals sine of 180 equals zero. I get no torque when I pull on a door like that, right? Have you ever tried to open a door by pulling it away from the hinge? If you have, why? What were you? What was your thought pattern for that? No. So you're going to apply some force to the hinge, right? It's going to stress the hinge, but it's not going to make uh, the door rotate. So there is no torque there. Um, okay. So that's torque. And then um, I go through the derivation in the video, so I'm not going to do it here. I'll just say when you um, put this into Newton's second law and you get it in a form where you get torque on one side and angular acceleration on the other side, you get this expression, tau equals I alpha. And better said, we should say tau net so that we can say the acceleration of, of an object, the angular acceleration of an object um, is a result of a net torque. Just like the acceleration, the linear acceleration of any object is a result of the net force on it, right? So when we say, um, you know, a box is attached to a pulley or a string over a pulley, the acceleration of the box downward is a result of both the gravity pulling down and the tension pulling back up, right? The balance of those two 
whatever is left, um, once you subtract the two, that's what causes acceleration. Same thing here. If we had two or three or more torques acting on something, the um, sum of all of those torques would give me um, something related to how that object accelerates. Um, okay, so that leaves this. What is I? That is um, rotational inertia. Um, I call it moment of inertia. Although in some engineering courses, they use moment as the, um, that's their word for torque, um, which confuses me uh, because I've never taken this in an engineering sense. I've always taken it in a physics sense. It's the same thing. It's just the, the variables are different. Um, okay, so moment of inertia is just um, an object's resistance to being rotated. All right, it's it's the rotational equivalent of mass, but it's not just mass because um, the um, the resistance of something to being um, rotated depends not just on mass, but also on how that mass is distributed. Um, how do I describe that uh, in an everyday example? Um, No, I'm trying to think of something, something you would like have in your house that that you could, that isn't a hammer. I've already talked about it for a hammer, but let's let's talk about that. Um, so I drew a hammer in the in the video. I drew Thor's hammer because I actually have a foam Thor's hammer that I use as a prop for this, but. but it's in my office at work. So there's a hammer. Um, and the um, if you're going to rotate this about this end, right, you could apply some torque and you would get um, some resulting alpha, right? Um, and the, the difficulty that it takes, right, the effort that it takes, the torque that it takes to get that alpha depends on the mass of the hammer for sure. Um, but if you took that same hammer and tried to rotate it about the head, meaning this is now my axis of rotation, right? So I'm, come on, man. So I'm rotating it this way. Let's apply the same torque. Um, I'm going to get a much bigger alpha from this. which depending on how you're thinking of this might be counterintuitive. Um, but if, I, so if I'm trying to rotate this thing, let's say you're trying to shake the hammer back and forth, right? So if you're trying to shake the hammer back and forth, it takes a lot more effort if you're holding the handle than if you're holding the head. If you hold the head of the hammer, you can rotate this pretty easily because most of what you're doing is rotating the, the handle, right? Um, most of the mass is not rotating very much because it's sitting right at the axis of rotation. So um, that's my argument for the moment of inertia depends on both the mass and where the mass is relative to the axis of rotation. So I'm talking about two different axes here. Um, okay, let me pause. I've talked a lot. Um, what questions do you have about this? Um, let me give you two more equations, maybe one more equation, one more idea, and then we'll try to do um, an example or two. Um, yeah, so moment of inertia in general for a point mass is the mass times the distance um, that act that mass is from the axis of rotation. So if I have how do you draw a baton, right? It's like kind of like a barbell, right? So let's ignore the mass of the bar and just say, I have a baton and I'm gonna rotate it around the center. So I've got two masses, 
a mass here and a mass there. Here's a mass, there's a mass, everywhere's a mass, mass. I have some small children. Okay. Um, so the moment of inertia for this system about its center would be m r squared plus m r squared, right? So two m r squared because there are two masses there. What if I held the baton by one end and tried to, to rotate it that way, right? I've seen people twirl batons. You can do it both ways, right? Uh, so if I were going to rotate this about the end, so for this one, let me say, there was the center. I'll redraw it for the other example. So there's my baton, exact, exact same baton, but now let's rotate it about like this end. So what do I have now? Well, I've got a mass here and a mass there and a, a distance here that is now 2R. Right, or I could call that L, and the previous one could have been L halves this way and L halves that way. Doesn't really matter. Um, so now I'm going to say the moment of inertia. I would like it to change colors there. Is um, m times zero squared plus m times two r squared. Do you see that? Because one of the masses is sitting right at the axis of rotation, so that r is nothing, and the other one is two r. So if I do that math, looks like I'm going to have four m r squared, right? So it looks like it's harder to rotate this um, about an end than it is to rotate it about the center. And if you've ever twirled a baton um, or you know shaken a stick, you would notice the same thing. So I encourage you to shake a stick. And if you uh, have a front porch and people walk through your lawn, you could shake, right. Um, so let me do one other thing. I have seven minutes. Um, I wanted to bring up, oh, that's not gonna do it. Oh yeah, this will be fine. So clearly I talked about this in the, in the lecture because I annotated it a little bit. Um, here's a table of moments of inertia for things that aren't point masses, right? Um, let me erase these. Oh, okay. Um, so the um, Generally, generally speaking, you would get these expressions. So you see, these are all, um, I'm going to mark it up again. That's fine. All of these expressions for moments of inertia. These are all um, a mass times some distance squared times a prefactor. And the prefactor is basically a function of geometry, right? So the hoop has a prefactor of one because all of the masses at a distance are. So it's basically it. Um, a point mass smeared out over the circumference of, of, a, of the like circular path. Um, a solid sphere is a prefactor of a half. Um, a solid, no, solid sphere is two-fifths. A solid cylinder is a half. A thin spherical shell is two-thirds. And here we actually see if our baton were not point masses but an actual stick, um, we see uh, that the prefactors kind of match what we saw for point masses that it's harder to shake, to, to rotate um, that same object about an end than it is about the center. Questions about moment of inertia here? Again, if you just think of it as um, how hard it is to rotate something, that's basically the, uh, the idea, right? In the same sense that mass is a measure of how hard it is to accelerate something, right? Um, that's why bigger vehicles need beefier engines because um, if you want to accelerate in a in a reasonable um, uh, like a a street scale, right? You need um, enough uh, power from your engine to accelerate your car um, based on its mass. So uh, I do want to do an example today. I promise I really do. I'm just trying to decide which one I want to do.
let's do um, example number three, because I think I have enough time to, to talk about that. Um, as much as I like the pickle jar one, I think you can follow that. Okay, so example number three um, says an athlete holds a, a two kilogram steel ball in his hand. Um, his arm is 70 centimeters long and has a mass of four kilograms. What is the magnitude of the torque about his shoulder if he's holding, holding his arm straight out? Parallels of the fourth. Okay. So let's draw a picture of this situation. Um, we're going to model his arm as um, a uniform rod. Right, I know that an, an arm is is not um, the mass isn't evenly distributed, but this will get us a good place to start. And then, if we wanted to correct this, we could model the arm as I don't know a, a bicep that's uniform and a forearm that's uniform. Um, that's probably still not accurate, but it's um, this is just a place to start. So here's his arm. Let's put his shoulder right here. So this will treat as our axis of rotation. Actually, we know that's what we want to treat as the axis of rotation because we're looking for torque about his shoulder. So those words, about his shoulder, tells us what we want to use as our axis of rotation. All right. Often, um, problems will be set up where um, there's a clear hinge, right? So your arm rotates around your shoulder very clearly. You can calculate the torque on your arm about your hand, um, but it's not usually useful. It might be in some situation that I haven't thought of, but that's not usually useful. Uh, okay, so what do we have? We've got the arm and we've got a, um, a two kilogram steel ball at the end. So there's my two kilogram ball. Um, we're gonna treat the arm as if all of the mass is at the center of mass. Again, um, if you haven't watched that video, go watch the center of mass video. Um, we derive center of mass as a tool for um, how we can treat gravity acting on an extended object. So um, mathematically, it is identical to say all of the weight of the arm is acting at the center of the arm, even though I know weight is actually acting a, on, on all of the points of the arm everywhere. So this is weight of the arm and the weight of the ball here. And we're asking for torque, right? So what is the net torque? That's the question. Um, by the way, this is torque due to gravity, right? Um, so we often call that gravitational torque. Um, gravity is not the only thing that causes torque, but in this case, this is what we care about is, is um, just gravity. The other thing you could be doing is um, the hand could be holding like, um, like a, rubber, a rubber band, right? Uh, like an exercise band. That would also cause some torque around the, um, the shoulder. Um, in that case, you would not be finding just gravitational torque, but you would need to include gravity. Okay, so um, we recall, and I am very close to it on here, guys. We recall that the definition of torque is R, F, sine theta. So F for each of these is weight, right? Um, R and F, no, R and sine theta, we need, need to figure out. Theta, let's let's write R on each of these. So there's R A and there's R B. And it looks like theta for each of those is 90 degrees. So sine theta is going to be one, right? Sine of 90 is one. Um, okay, so let's do one more line here, maybe two more lines. So tau net is tau for the ball plus tau for the arm, right? And it's important to include the, um, the arm here because um, it's twice the mass of the ball, right? Uh, and so even if you're just holding your arm out, right, your shoulder is experiencing some torque um, due to that. Uh, okay, so I need R ball um, times the weight of the ball times sine of theta, again, theta is 90, plus R for the arm 
times the weight of the arm times sine of 90. I made these positive. Um, that's because we treat, I made another color here. Um, that's our positive direction, right? Counterclockwise is what we call positive. Um, so if we're starting at the x-axis, going up is positive, and that should feel natural. Um, and if it doesn't, we just have to pick it, right? There are two directions in rotation. There's clockwise and counterclockwise. We just have to pick one to be positive. Um, counterclockwise works out mathematically for lots of other reasons that I want to get into here. Um, okay, so then we're just plugging in. Um, but so the, the reason I, I mentioned I made those both positive is because they're causing torque around this axis that is positive. Okay, so let me plug these in and we'll call it good. Well, I'll leave B as a, um, you can check out the, the solutions. Um, so R, B, please, just, R, B is 70 centimeters. So it's, this is why on the right-hand side of the page, my handwriting gets worse because I can't set my hand down. Um, the weight of the ball is two kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, plus um, the arm is acting at the center of the center of mass, so that's 0.35 times that mass is four kilograms times 9.8 times one. Okay, so if you add those together, you get 27.44 um, kilogram meter times meter over second squared, um, which we call a Newton meter. That's about 27 Newton meters. It's also a joule, but joules for this doesn't make much sense. Um, okay, so that's the torque about the, um, the shoulder. Um, does that make sense? Ask again. Um, do you have any questions about, about this so far? So was uh, the 9.8 in that equation, is, is that sine theta? No, the 9.8 is part of weight. Let me find another color here. So weight sub B is M sub B times G, which is two kilograms times 9.8. That's what I put right here. Okay, that what is the sine theta then? The sine theta is, um, it's one. Oh, okay. I just didn't bother to put it in. Gotcha. Cool. Good question. Other questions? So what we'll do tomorrow is we will um, we'll we'll start looking at dynamics. So tau equals i alpha. In this case, alpha was zero. So just finding the net torque was a useful thing. Um, so the next step we could do is if there is a net torque, if there is a net torque, then um, we can start solving for an acceleration here. By the way, um, there would have to be, so we found gravitational torque. There would have to be another force here causing, um, causing the net torque to be zero. It would have to be a muscle, right? There would be a muscle attached like right here-ish. So you could use this to figure out if you know the angle that that muscle is making with the with the like the the arm is that a femur? Not a bio dude. So um, you could figure out how how much force that uh, muscle has to apply here. Okay, lots of interesting things we can do. We'll see more of that in the pre lectures for tomorrow and the lecture tomorrow. Thank you guys for your attention, and um, have a great evening.